surrounds you. As day turns in tonight, it should really be the chance for our stars to shine. But a lot of people believe we are not getting the night skies that we should get because of light pollution from our homes and offices and from street lamps and from industry. It's the 24-hour universe that we live in. Clearly, we need some lights for safety and security or the perception of safety and security. But over and above those considerations, what rights do we have to expect dark skies at night? And this is what we're missing. Without light pollution, we should be able to see our own galaxy, the Milky Way. We should be able to see thousands of stars on a clear night, but in the worst affected areas, we can only see a couple of dozen of the very brightest. According to the Campaign for the Protection of Rural England, light pollution is increasing and we're seeing fewer stars every year. This is one of the most frightening statistics. 80 to 85 percent of the children in Britain are not able to see even a small portion of the Milky Way. They have no idea what they can see, what they should be able to see up there. And I think if they're cut off from such a really primal experience, they're really missing something. In fact, being able to see the, the sky at night shows us, or reveals to us, our place in the bigger scheme of things. So what are we going to see here then? Well, from up here, we're in one of the highest parts of Essex. Uh, well, let's say higher, 50 metres above sea level. From here, you've got a good view of the... Daniel Nixon also wants more stars for his money. When he was at university, he started a campaign and website called Needless. He grew up in South Essex, one of the worst places in the region for light pollution. The London glow doesn't help, and from the churchyard on the hill at Rettenden, the effect is startling. Welcome to Vegas. People don't see light pollution as a, a real pollution. It's, it's not a toxin, but it is uh, degrading a natural part of our environment. Half of our environment as we see it is rendered invisible through careless use of light. Tell me, yeah. be honest, can you see any beauty in this at all? I know it's man-made, but some people can, can't they? From up here, looking down on these orange lights sparkling away on the horizon all around. It does not compare to be able to look up at the lights from, from space, the twinkling stars. This does not compare to the beauty of being able to look up and see what nature has to offer. So much more. Daniel's needless website has a simulation of the kind of lighting he'd like to see and the difference he believes it would make. Here's the night sky. Let's add a light and, and see what happens. If we add an old globe light, the sodium orange glow, straight away you can see there's loads of spillage and our, our vision of the night sky is really impaired and it's kind of random lighting, not focused at all. This is the semi-cut-off light, a kind of halfway house and again our vision of the night sky is somewhat diminished. If we go to full cut-off lighting, which is what the Needless campaign is advocating, and straight away you can see that light is concentrated downwards, it's white light, there's very little spillage, it's energy efficient, and you can see pretty much all of the night sky in all its glory. Councils are starting to replace sodium lamps with energy efficient white ones. They're not doing it so we can all wonder at the galaxy. It's to save money, but a happy byproduct is a reduction in light pollution. Well, these are the uh, old orange sodium lights that served as well for the best part of 30 years. They were never really that efficient, though. They're destined now for recycling. New technology is taking over. The future is bright. The future's white. Many councils, including North Hants and Norfolk, are rolling out new lights. In Norfolk, a £25 million scheme will see the orange lamps consigned to history. It's not really state of the art. Airports have been down lighting in this way for years, but now the technology is more affordable and efficient. They're now available in bulk. They're economic. They use less energy. They require less maintenance and they're a benefit all round. And one of the side effects of that is they, they have a better light 
pattern, a better recognition, and they also shine down and not up. And the future is white out of town too in many parts of our region. This is the A140 in Suffolk. White LED lights are happily breeding and campaigners against light pollution want councils to go further down that road. Malden in Essex was the first and now many councils are turning off street lights at midnight. In Hertfordshire it's saving 1.3 million a year. In North Hants they've removed half of the light bulbs, saving two million a year. It's austerity over astronomy, but the net effect is darker skies. We, we clearly struck a chord um, with many, many people. The council say it hasn't led to an increase in crime, but it can increase the fear of crime. Daniel Graham has started a petition in Hertfordshire to switch the lights back on. Crime is one factor within this equation. The other equations are simple health and safety um, and people being able to conduct and go about their daily lives without fear of curfew. Turning the lights off just, you know, de facto isn't necessarily the solution. Um, the lights that have been in place have been in place for a long, long time. LED lights, uh, white lights, Bretter lights are a much better option. But what about the lights of industry? Austerity measures are making public lighting less polluting, but private lighting on retail parks, industrial units, lorry parks and farms is largely unregulated. The Fender Care HQ is in rural Norfolk, right next door to the Norwich Observatory. Although it has no obligation to, the company is mindful of how much light it pours into the night. We have to look at cost, of course, to the business, etc. But we, we are very mindful on, on the environment, you know, the pollution. So we have to put all that in, into the actual mix itself. And we've still got the duty of care for our employees to come into work as well. So that's why when we did the planning application, it did come back from the application from South Norfolk Council that can we view our lighting because of the observatory nearby. And that's what we did. It's bad, but there's hope. At the University of Hertfordshire, they have one of the largest robotic observatories in Europe, and they have the latest data on the extent of light pollution in the east. The southern part of Hertfordshire and the southern part of Essex, it significantly contaminates our light, which basically reduces the number of stars we can see. Um, as we move further away, coastal areas are really good because they tend to be away from big conurbations, but also, of course, you've only got light coming from one side, so they tend to be really dark. Um, isolated areas, for example, in Essex, the Dengue Peninsula is particularly dark. Losing is very, very bright, and it's basically two factors. Um, it's basically distance and the volume of lighting. We have a growing population, housing targets and 24-hour living, but light pollution should improve. Because we're tightening our belts and because of better technology, the night sky has a dark future. I think children should have a right to see the stars. I think it's terrible that so many children, in fact, so many adults, have never really seen the stars look up and wonder. It's one of the great natural wonders of our world. And you can find out more about this week's programmes and events in our region by going to bbc.co.uk slash stargazing. They're heroes of World War II. So why is the British government stopping these veterans receiving their medals? We're asking if cows in our fields could be replaced by this. And we look back at the history of the country's first ever play park, Wicksteed in Northamptonshire. <laughs> 